great deal of thought, Grandpa. Here is a bulletin from CBS News. From Dallas, Texas, the Flash apparently official, President Kennedy was podcasted at 1 p.m. Central Standard Time, 2 o'clock Eastern Standard Time, some 38 minutes ago. Vice President Lyndon Johnson <clears throat> has left the podcast in Dallas, but we do not know to where he has proceeded. Uh, presumably, he will be joining Chapo Trap House shortly and become the sixth Mike of the American left. Hey there, everybody, and welcome back to Death is Just Around the Corner. I believe this will be episode 69. We are coming to you live. Well, I was going to say live on set, actually not on set, live from uh, sub-basement two of production Annex 3B for the film Air Bud Dwyer, the one we mentioned last time. And um, uh, to be honest with you, think, things have gotten kind of weird around here. You know, not that not that we're not grateful for the work, of course, looking at gift horse in the mouth and so forth, but there is a lot of money behind this thing, way more than seems commensurate with the uh, commercial prospects of a direct-to-DVD film. And I come to think of it, isn't that weird in itself, direct-to-DVD? Shouldn't it be streaming or something? So anyway, uh, shortly after our last episode, we took these concerns uh, respectfully, gently, mildly, up to management, and we're told, don't worry, you're going to have a chance to meet the money man, the guy who's bankrolling all this, the executive of executive producers. Uh, and a few days ago, we are all lined up, like for roll call, in front of the main production office, and a limo pulls up, and we wait, and no one gets out of it. And then another limo pulls up, and we wait, and no one gets out of it. And then, And then three more limos, and at this point... Lo, I say unto ye, uh, I was visited by a, a vision of limos just pulling up behind each other forever and no one getting out, kind of like uh, something from a Flann O'Brien novel. And, and the line of limos reaching the horizon and instead of going over the horizon, sort of curling back around the way that, you know, when two mirrors reflect each other, they'll produce this long curved chain of visual echoes. And um, at that point, I thought it was best to uh, remove myself from the proceedings. So I went around the corner into the alley for a cigarette and just just happened to see what I would swear was a cadaver being stretchered into the side door in the alley. And this cadaver, I only saw it for a moment, but what I remember is a, a tall, emaciated white man with a... Uh, long gray brown hair and beard and the main thing i noticed is that his fingers and toenails were extremely long like two three inches out beyond the end of each digit and i didn't know what to say or do about that so i kept quiet and then just yesterday i was up in uh, the lobby of production annex 3b uh collating and rearranging our display of extremely hip magazines and i heard this uh this sort of long roaring noise, the sound of wheels rolling, um, and looked down the hallway, and here came a production assistant sweating, grunting, and pushing on a dolly what I would say was about a three-quarter size refrigerator, and I could tell that in between the grunts he was talking to himself, but I couldn't hear what he was saying over the sound of the wheels, but as he passed me, I distinctly heard him say, it was something like this, it was, I know he's in there. God damn it, I just know that he must be in there. Um, I assume in there, meaning in the fridge, and he, you know, who else but the executive producer. So uh, more updates on that as, as they become available. But now to the purpose of this episode. 
As we said last time, it's become increasingly clear to us here at Death is Just Around the Corner that it's going to be impossible to talk about Thomas Pinchon or really most good, worthwhile uh, American art of the latter half of the 20th century without talking about John Kennedy and the Kennedy assassination. And what we do not propose to do here is what people normally do in reference to the Kennedy assassination. Either A, just sort of wallow in the mythos of it, you know, the Kennedy legend, the tragic cursed bloodline, blah, 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 bullshit. Or B, compile every single uh, cross-indexed theory and compare every little bit of possible plausible evidence to every other little bit. Um, we do have a version of events that we think is, is probably the most feasible, or rather I should say we have learned from others a version of events that seems the most feasible. And we'll get to that in one of the uh, follow-up episodes, but the main purpose of this is not to anatomize the shooting itself, to talk about who pulled the trigger on the grassy knoll, and yes, it was on the grassy knoll, and no, Lee Harvey Oswald did not kill John Kennedy. It's to talk about the world that produced the agencies that wanted to kill Kennedy, that produced the political situation that made Kennedy's death necessary in their eyes, because this, though most of us don't know it or think about it, is very much the world that we still live in. What happened in the Kennedy assassination was not just a president dying. It was the coronation of a slow developing coup that had been going on, I mean, arguably as far back as 1945, but certainly uh, by 1953 it was well underway. Uh, the coming to power of a collaboration of military industrial elites and intelligence agencies who made it very, very clear to any aspirant politician, especially aspirant president, there are certain limits beyond which you will not go. And if you do, we'll blow your fucking head off in front of a hundred people and everyone will see it. And we will lie and lie and lie and lie about what happened until people are either too exhausted or driven too crazy to do anything about it. So, you know, let's not keep you, our beloved listeners, in suspense. The CIA killed John Kennedy. It's, it's the only explanation that makes any sense. It's the only explanation with the critical mass of necessary evidence. Whether or not a... Uh, a CIA officer or agent personally pulled the trigger on the grassy knoll. We don't know. Again, we'll get to that. That's not the point, though. The CIA is the entity that had Kennedy killed. Okay, why did it happen? It happened essentially for three reasons, and you can rank them in order of importance as you see fit. Number one, after the Cuban Missile Crisis which completely changed John Kennedy's politics. He was, through back channels, secretly negotiating peace with the Soviet Union and Cuba and an end to the Cold War. Number two, Kennedy was going to pull American troops out of Vietnam by 1965. The day, I believe the day before he died, he told uh, uh, a confidant, may have been Pierre Salinger, pardon me if I'm fucking up the details here, but I remember the quote, that Vietnam is not worth another American life. And he told this confidant that he wasn't going to run on ending the American engagement in Vietnam uh, in 64 because he wasn't sure how that would play. But as soon as he was reelected, he was going to start pulling out the troops and there would be no American military in Vietnam by the end of 1965. And number three, Kennedy not only wanted to, but was already in the process of trying and failing to dismantle the CIA. After the Bay of Pigs, uh, he made it his mission, and these are his words, not mine, to scatter its ashes to the four winds, its being the CIA, because he had come to understand by that point 
that uh, the government that we elect, the government whose faces we're allowed to see and names we're allowed to know, uh, has a very circumscribed, limited degree of power, and that the decisions which sort of set the stage in geopolitical terms, the decisions which define the conditions of every decision made after them, those are not made by anybody who gets elected. Those are usually not even made by people whose names you'd recognize. But in order to explain how we got to this point and how things have endured this way, we need to go back to 1945 and talk about three things. The nuclear bomb, the Cold War, and this question, much more complicated than it seems, what is the CIA? fitting for the methodology of this show, uh, we're going to answer those in all kinds of different orders because they're inextricably entangled questions. So let's start just to get some delusions out of the way with a partial answer to this question, what is the CIA? Now, from a million shitty movies and books and from its self-presentation, you will have been given the idea that the CIA is just another government agency, albeit one that deals in matters more recondite than uh, some of the others, but really, you know, no more threatening in its way than uh, the NSA or the FBI, which, believe me, are threatening enough. Uh, and then there's this sort of action movie view that the CIA consists largely of two kinds of people, um, and the first kinds are James Bond type guys who wear polo shirts and uh, when they go to Arab countries they grow beards and they wear cargo pants and they do James Bond type shit. And the other type, uh, those are people who wear suits and sit in dark offices and darkly say things like, we think the firewall has been breached. Uh, to all of which, bullshit, bullshit, and bullshit. The CIA is not just another federal agency. The CIA is a parallel government within the government. It is, and for the better part of 70 years now, has been uh, what we in current parlance refer to as a deep state. Uh, now, I'll explain in time what exactly I mean by all this, but I think before that, it befits us to set the stage with this question of the nuclear bomb and the Cold War. Now, friends, brothers, sisters, brethren and sestren and, and mothers and fathers, I, I don't like it any more than you do, but I am compelled to admit that the, uh, the single salient historical fact of the modern era, in fact, the thing that gave birth to the modern era, is the invention of the nuclear bomb. That is the the node from which everything flows. Uh, first of all, because of the uh, several hundreds of thousands, we may never know exactly how many, of Japanese people that it killed, and the probable several millions of Japanese people uh, to which it gave cancer and radiation sickness and radiation burns and horrible disfigurements and mutilations and... Uh, induced stillbirths and miscarriages and birth defects. And by the by, as long as we're talking about it, the idea that we uh, had to drop the atomic bomb on Japan, that it was actually the more humane option to prevent, you know, the bloody warfare that would have gone on without it, is complete fucking horseshit. There's absolutely nothing to support that idea. And the evidence that does exist points to a Japanese readiness to surrender. It's just that we were afraid that Japan might fuck around and surrender to Russia instead of us. And we were not going to let that happen. So we dropped atomic bombs. 
And uh, before even that, you know, what I think most people would think of as the first major effect of the atomic bombs, uh, well, there were the effects of the testing. And this is yet another case of a submerged purpose. Naturally, we, you know, we're just going to test the bombs. But uh, this idea that we didn't have any notion of the sort of health effects that nuclear weapons testing might cause or that fallout might bring about, uh, I don't believe at all. I mean, part of the purpose of building a fucking nuclear weapon is the health effects it will cause. Otherwise, it's just a giant goddamn bomb. And I am of the opinion that we tested those weapons in the desert, not just because it was a big expanse of open land, but because we were very, very interested in what would happen to the people who lived downwind of the testing ranges, who are predominantly poor, uh, live in these little towns in fucking middle of nowhere, New Mexico, Utah, whatever, uh, and who are in large degree, if not majority, Native American, just as the land we were helping to poison for eons was in significant part uh, Native American. And if there is one consistent fact about the United States, really even about the Americas, you know, since they've had the name the Americas, the one thing that holds true for that 500-year history, it's that we don't give a fuck about Native Americans. We have never given a fuck about Native Americans. They still live on sort of polite versions of concentration camps. And uh, though we're never going to know how many of them we killed in the European conquest of these two continents, the historian Eduardo Galeano estimated, if I'm not mistaken, in his book, uh, Open Veins of Latin America, that the European conquest of the Americas killed somewhere between 90 and 120 million Native Americans, which is just a fact that uh, none of us wants anything to do with at all. Obviously, dwarfs, even the, the highest end estimates of Stalin's or Mao's uh, death totals, easily the greatest genocide in human history, assuming Galeano is anywhere near correct. So the idea that we would uh, intentionally inflict the various maladies caused by radiation upon defenseless people, uh, particularly Native Americans, that doesn't strike me as far-fetched at all. That strikes me, in fact, as probable, given what we already know about the Tuskegee syphilis trials before that, uh, about the Edgewood Arsenal chemical weapons testing programs after that. We've done a lot of this shit. We have tested weaponry on our own people over and over and over and over. So there's an effect before even the effects of the nuclear bomb. But... All the effects we've mentioned so far are what you might call direct effects. Now we're interested in the nuclear bomb as having created a, what you might call a political cosmology, uh, having given birth to a different world in which the central fact, again, was the fact that a couple of nations had enough of a certain kind of weapon to destroy life on Earth forever. So what did this mean? Uh, it meant, in practical terms, an incredible spree of spending on weapons and technological control systems, uh, an unprecedented outpouring of defense contracts from which the entire uh, consumer electronics industry emerges the fact that you've got a computer, the fact that you have anything to listen to this on or I have anything to record it on is blowback from the nuclear bomb. All of that money going to anything that promised to give us either finer control of our own weaponry or more effective weaponry or finer sensing and uh, ability to disable other people's weaponry – and then, you know, the shrapnel, the side effects, the, the movement, the evolution of the computer from, you know, a room-sized thing fed with fucking Scantron punch cards to the thing that's presently sitting in your lap or, you know, dangling in your pocket. This all comes from the nuclear bomb. And 
as we've mentioned before, one of the most uh, important children of the nuclear bomb is the Internet, which has been, is, will always be a military industrial project, a weapon, a tool of surveillance. I don't know how many of you uh, keep up with the podcast on Twitter, and I keep forgetting to mention this, but the, uh, the Twitter account for the podcast is Corpse in Orbit, at Corpse in Orbit. But we posted there an excellent episode of uh, the Radio War Nerd show, hosted by John Dolan and Mark Ames, in which they interviewed Yasha Levine, who's a tech journalist, about the military history of the Internet. And this was you know, the overriding message over and over again. The Internet was always supposed to be a weapon. Uh, it was always supposed to be a way to collect information about dissidents in particular and to use that information against them. And then, as with uh, so many other forms of defense contracting, there are all the commercial benefits to be reaped, too. That as, as long as we're collecting, you know, dragnet surveillance data about people who we want to accuse, usually spuriously, of crimes, well, we've got the same data about people who we're not going to accuse of anything. And look, it tells you uh, the kind of shit they like to buy, the sort of TV they like to watch, even, for God's sake, the kinds of dreams they have. All very, very useful, don't you see? All marketable and all direct, uh, how shall we say, flow down from nuclear weaponry and the subsequent orgy of military spending. That's one uh, cosmological effect. The other was the handing over of government to various kinds of secretive technocratic elites either technocratic in the literal sense, in that they're, they're the people who know how the technology works, or at least claim to, the people who, uh, who, whom, I should say, we can trust to use the technology wisely, to keep it uh, maintained, to improve it every now and again, or technocratic elites in the sense of uh, primarily intelligence agencies. And of all the intelligence agencies, not just in the United States, but in the world, the intelligence agency is the CIA. Now, in uh, common parlance, this would be kind of a, a distributed and disparate and somewhat scattered uh, and <laughs> also uncommon and unreferred to definition of the Cold War. Folks, the Cold War was World War III. World War III has already fucking happened. It just didn't happen between the United States and Russia. It happened all over Central and South America, all over Asia, all over Africa, all over the Caribbean. It happened essentially uh, everywhere except America, Western Europe, and Russia. World War III was fought primarily by proxy armies taking out democratically elected politicians and installing various kinds of authoritarian dictators in order to turn third world nations into labor colonies. That was the aspiration. World War III was uh, primarily, more than anyone else, orchestrated by the CIA for the purposes both of CIA control, of enrichment both of the actual agents and assets of the CIA and of, you know, people in the same sort of circles, the sort of uh, industrialists upon whom they rely, and in general for the spread of American political power via American-centered capitalism. You know, we talk so much about the neoliberal era, you know, and globalization in terms strictly of market forces and political decision making and ideology and of course all of that matters but i as a you know a member uh, i guess a nominal member of the left am happy to chide the left i do it often for consistently failing to meet my expectations for uh not taking any serious view of the role of intelligence agencies and illegal secret war in the process that you know transformed the world from 
what it was in, say, 1950 to what it is now. Because all of that ideology, you know, all of that uh, economic doctrine, it only matters if you're dealing with a foreign government, quote unquote foreign, uh, for that matter, quote unquote government, malleable enough to do it, whatever it is you tell them to do. And most of the time to get that kind of government, you have to depose the government that came before it. And uh, we did that all over the goddamn world. And then when it became clear that John Kennedy was going to be an impediment to that, we did it here, which is why I call the Kennedy assassination a coup. A coup is precisely what it was. It was uh, a subtle kind of coup. <laughs> you, it may seem strange to associate, you know, subtlety with what happened in Dallas in 1963, but subtle in that there was no apparent discontinuity of government. No one came out and said the government has fallen. You know, we're now living under a military dictatorship. And we don't live under a military dictatorship. What we live under is a divided system. Uh, on the one hand, we have politics, the game show, in which people run for office by making speeches and raising uh, lots of money from either the credulous or the uh, opportunistic and get elected to offices and then usually do nothing much uh, unless there is some way to enrich themselves or their backers directly. And we talk about this as if it's, you know, the entirety of politics as if it's the only kind of politics that matters, all that disgusting fucking DC insider horse race journalism bullshit, Steve Kornacki, Nate Silver, go fuck yourselves. Yeah, there's, there's that part of the system. Then there's the other part. The hub of the other part for most of the last, let's say, 65 years has been the CIA, which has dictated... Uh, American policy toward the rest of the world and through that, you know, dictation of foreign policy on the first level has effectively dictated domestic policy because, of course, foreign policy in terms of uh, money spent on buying shit to kill people, that always gets paid for first. You know, the social safety net, fuck it, leave that to last. You know, any remnants of the New Deal, let them burn, but for God's sake, don't hold up a military spending bill in Congress. And, of course, every fucking Democrat is just as guilty of complicity in this as every fucking Republican. It's time, I think, to talk in some depth about what the CIA is. As I have said, a parallel state, a parallel government, and one with uh, a number of different functions that operates in a number of different ways. Uh, I think this will seem strange to some of you and uh, hyperbolic to others, but I think there are two decent analogs for the CIA and other times in other places. And one of them would be the SS in Nazi Germany, which, as some of you will know, uh, started out as you know what it says it is, a Schutzstaffel, a protection squad, literally just security for members of the Nazi party and ended up developing into a parallel governmental structure. Because of course, when you know Hitler took over Germany as Reichskanzler in 1933, he inherited all kinds of pre-existing political and corporate bureaucracy. Um, the SS became the organization responsible for seeing that all of this bureaucracy was working not on whatever its ostensible public mission was, but working to implement the ideology of Nazism. The SS was the interface between, you know, Hitler as tyrannical overlord and government as a thing that, you know, actual people still have to do every day. You know, the mail did get delivered in Nazi Germany, at least sometimes. You know, the, the, the lights came on, the tap water worked. So in order to mediate between you know nazism as a purely ideological phenomenon and government as a pragmatic one 
the SS changed from this protection staff, this, you know, bodyguard squad, into essentially a second uh, parasitic German government. And it's recorded over and over and over that other Nazis were as fearful of and hateful toward the SS as, you know, civilians were fearful of and hateful toward the Nazis. The SS scared the shit out of higher ups in the Nazi party quite as much as they did anybody else. And of course, they were primarily responsible for the concentration camps and the death squads, the Einsatzgruppen, and eventually, you know, the thing we now call the Holocaust. Uh, that's one parallel. You know, a, I mean, the word parallel is, is used advisedly, a parallel governmental structure, in that case, right out in the open. You know, a government whose loyalty was not to the execution of any particular office or the function of any particular, you know, uh, governmental utility, but to Nazism as an ideology. The other parallel that occurs to me to the CIA, and this, this may seem strange, uh, would be the East India companies of the 16, 17, 1800s, and particularly the British East India Company, which occupied this bizarre position in British political hierarchy in that it was both a private chartered corporation, or rather I should say a private joint stock corporation, and a part of the British government. It was a governmental entity that made governmental decisions, but was also run for profit by people working privately to enrich themselves. And uh, one way to describe that structure would be fascism. It was a proto-fascist entity. And it would do pretty much anything it wanted as long as it could justify that desire as being in some way in the interests of the British crown. Uh, I didn't know until recently, maybe, maybe some of you knew this already and I'm, I'm late, but until the 1880s, I believe, I think 1886, the entire British imperial occupation of India, that did not belong to the British state. It didn't belong to the monarchy. It didn't belong to parliament. It was not part of Britain as a political entity. The British Empire in India belonged to the British East India Company. They're the ones who actually ran it. They were, uh, I was going to say entrusted with, but maybe they just took, arrogated unto themselves. Uh, the maintenance and operation and horrific exploitation of Britain's largest and most important colonial holding. Again, this, this is proto-fascism and uh, dovetails very neatly with some of the operations of the CIA because the political agenda of the CIA is fascist. I say that unequivocally. Now, as we all know, fascism, one of the most overused words of the 20th century, People don't, not they. It's not just that they don't know what it means. It's that they don't fucking care what it means anymore. They're, it's it's invective at this point. But insofar as it can be used in concrete terms to describe a political system, fascism is basically two things. Uh, number one, it's violent authoritarianism. You know the authority often of a single individual, a Führer or Duce, but not always a single individual, uh, that is enforced via the use of, you know, mass coordinated state violence. And number two, it is the erosion of the line between the public and private spheres, between government and corporation until that distinction ceases to mean anything at all. Now, this is one of the things that we are generally not taught about Nazi Germany. You know, the, the Nazism we learn about in high school, or whatever, is so focused on the mythological evil of Nazism and the particularly mythically evil figure of Adolf Hitler that we're, we're very rarely given any instruction into you know, how it was that Germany worked 
during that period and how it worked in effect in large part, not exclusively, but in large part was by setting up government corporate, you know, cooperative monopolies in various uh, fields and industries. At one point, the SS itself owned something like 220 holding companies. Uh, it owned a lot of private sector businesses and enterprises. And this is something that is generally not known about the CIA. The CIA owns a shitload of stuff, uh, wholly owned subsidiaries they call proprietaries. Uh, there are also businesses in which the CIA has part ownership almost exclusively through some kind of you know front or holding company. They don't say 17% owned by the CIA. And the CIA has employees placed all throughout the upper levels of the more sensitive industries here and elsewhere in uh, arms dealing, in arms development, in oil, in uh, anything having to do with, you know, economics on the, uh, the banking level, say like, you know, the IMF, the World Bank, those sorts of institutions, even in uh, supposedly charitable enterprises. USAID, the aid organization, that's been a CIA front since at least the 60s. IRC, the International Rescue Committee, CIA front since at least the 50s. And the list just goes on and on. Um, Air America, the airline, CIA front. Uh, Radio Free Europe and Radio Free Asia, both CIA fronts. Uh, allegedly, I've never seen any proof of this, but allegedly Bulova, the watch company, is a CIA front. Um, it is on record that there are entire divisions of, or there were at least, I'm sure they're, I'm sure they've gotten rid of them by now. I mean, this couldn't keep going on, right? There were entire divisions of Lockheed Martin that were effectively CIA fronts. This is part of why I say the CIA constitutes a parallel governmental structure. It is out there on the highest levels in every industry having anything to do with, you know, uh, issues of what they would call sensitive national interest. And fuck if the Cold War wasn't the perfect breeding ground for all this, because the Cold War represented, you might call a, a political economy, an economy of forces that we have been striving to recreate ever since it ended and sort of have recreated with the war on terror. Is think of the Cold War, think of the setup. You know, two sides, this fake Manichaean good and evil shit, both armed with nuclear weapons. And the conceit is that your enemy, in this case Soviet Russia, is faceless, shapeless, formless, nameless, moves in secret, and is responsible for all the evil in the world, even if it's not obvious. It's got sympathizers and secret agents working absolutely everywhere. Um, God, I believe it was Claire Sterling was the name of the guy who wrote a book in 1979 or 80 called The Terror Network, in which he alleged that the USSR was directly responsible for every single terrorist incident everywhere in the world. I mean, this book was taken seriously, or at least uh, was people feigned to take it seriously because it was useful to them to get their agendas accomplished. You know, and that's an important distinction to make. I think there were people who were clinically fucking paranoid about communism and, and the Soviet Union, people like Joseph McCarthy and Richard Nixon, and uh, for that matter, Howard Hughes. And I think there were people who were just willing to use the pretext of the Soviet Union to get done what they wanted to get done. I don't know enough about the personal lives of, of the CIA people we'll be talking about at length to say which they were. Certainly some were true believers. I would suspect that others were utter opportunistic cynics. So with this enemy that is somehow omnipresent, omnipresent and uh, omniscient and completely secret and impossible to identify, except of course when you claim you've identified it, this black box, this, you know, mayontological fucking 
negative theology of evil. You can do anything you want because you can justify anything you want in the name of fighting communist infiltration and subversion. And when someone says, are you sure that's what you're actually doing? Can you prove that's what you're actually doing? Not that people said that very often. The answer is, oh, oh, see, that's not how it works. Because the communist, the communist cannot be seen, cannot be heard. The communist does not submit to questions of proof. Communist infiltration is exactly the sort of insidious conspiracy that will rely on us to ask questions like, wait, is this even real? Or what the fuck are you doing in Guatemala? So the uh, American government, even on the, you know, the level of what I think of as game show politics, especially on the right, and through the military administration and especially through the CIA, had, God, they had a run there, you know, call it about 45 years, where in the name of fighting the Cold War, they were able to do absolutely everything they wanted to, in the CIA's case, with virtually no fucking oversight. This is an important fact about the CIA, and here we should talk about the structure of the CIA a little bit. Uh, it is not the top-down organization that you probably have the impression it is from, you know, the, uh, the official, the day-to-day -day kind of news. The director of the CIA, in large part, is responsible for not knowing things because he's the interface between the CIA and the rest of the government and has to maintain plausible deniability of all kinds of shit. So uh, don't ask him what's going on. You know, the fact if a CIA director testifies that he had no knowledge that X was happening, that may very well be true and it means absolutely nothing. The CIA, in some ways, you might describe as largely a group of contractors, largely uh, a group of people who, well, let's say logistics people and contractors. You know, there's the one side that has ideas and sets them up. Then there's the other side that goes out in the field, and sometimes those are the same people, and hires others to do the things they've planned. This is an important point too. The CIA very rarely acts on its own. Almost no uh, you know, leaders of countries have been assassinated by CIA officers in the technical sense. They've been assassinated by people the CIA has hired, uh, what are called assets. This is where we have to get into terminology. So there are sort of old and new styles for this because the CIA, like every clandestine agency, is obsessed with fucking lingo and jargon and, you know, making everything as uh, opaque as possible. In the most basic sense, there are CIA agents who used to be called officers. These are people who work directly for the CIA, whose names you could find uh, if there were such a thing, on a public directory of CIA employees. You know, people who, let's put it this way, if they got killed, it would be really hard for us to pretend that they weren't CIA agents. Then there are CIA assets or uh, contract agents. That was kind of the older style of referring to them. These are people that the CIA hires to do things. And they have ultimately you know, committed most of the CIA's crimes in the sense of actually pulling the trigger or pressing the button, though they were put up to it either with money or with political support or with threats by the CIA. And the agent who controls a given asset is called a handler. Uh, again, there's an old style for this. You once would have said the officer who controls a given contract agent is called a controller. So, Agents hire assets and become controllers. This is how the CIA works. It is a, you know, fractal, a cellular, a modular structure. No one at any given point knows everything that it's doing, probably even half of what it's doing. And to say that the CIA had Kennedy killed in 1963 is not necessarily even to allege 
that the director of the CIA in 1963 knew anything about it. I have no particular reason to believe that he did. I think it was a cadre of people from the CIA who, uh, who knew to some degree about Kennedy's plans to end the Cold War and the involvement in Vietnam and to shut down the CIA and who were also furious with him over uh, the Bay of Pigs and the Cuban Missile Crisis and our treatment of communism in general. So we got to work backward here to establish the history of how we got to that point. The prehistory of the CIA starts in 1939, a group called the OSS, the Office of Strategic Services, uh, which lasted from 1939 to 1945 uh, under the leadership of a fellow named Wild Bill Donovan, the father of American intelligence. And imagine the kind of asshole you have to be to get the nickname Wild Bill in that field. And the OSS was basically our spy shop during World War II. Uh, our equivalent of the British MI6, let's say, or SIS or whatever its official name is. Um, it did do, you know, what it was allegedly uh, convened to do. It did send spies behind enemy lines and so forth. It also did some other stuff. Um, it was very interested in various forms of psychological testing and profiling, for instance, as we've already mentioned uh, on one of the other episodes, who knows which one. There was an OSS agent or employee or asset, who knows what terms they were using then, uh, by the name of Dr. Henry Murray, a very eminent psychologist who developed for the OSS the completely batshit pseudoscience of criminal profiling during the war, and who, after the war, as the OSS metamorphosed into the CIA, would... Uh, take part in or direct any number of CIA and MK Ultra connected experiments, most famously the 1960 uh, LSD trial involving Timothy Leary at Harvard, and the 1959 to 1962 psychological torture trial at Harvard, uh, one of whose subjects was the young Ted Kaczynski. Now, after the war, the OSS was broken up. It was convened with the stipulation that it would be uh, disassembled when the war ended. And for a couple years there, it had its various responsibilities and departments spread among different parts of the federal government. But in 1947, Harry Truman was convinced, and when I say was convinced, you know, feel free to attribute the... Uh, the agency hiding behind that passive voice to uh, anyone who seems likely to you, maybe just to Harry Truman himself, that bigoted old stupid son of a bitch mass murderer. Anyway, Truman was convinced that we needed something like the OSS again. So he officially formed, I believe it was first called the Central Intelligence Group and then the Central Intelligence Agency. Uh, that's the official story, 1947. I, for one, would argue that effectively the CIA uh, came into being in 1945 in a funny little incident called Operation Sunrise. Uh, the hero of this story <laughs> is a guy named Alan W. Dulles. Uh, you, you may be aware of him, uh, director of the CIA from... 1953 to 1961, and one of the prime villains of modern world history, a man who will never, I mean, he's dead, but whose memory will never suffer anywhere near the level of bile and hatred it deserves, because he was one of the central makers of this fucked world we are, we are now occupying as it, uh, presently both drowns and overheats itself to death. Uh, Mr. Dulles here, he was an OSS agent. And he knew full well that the Allies had this little agreement whereby any Nazi surrender in World War II had to be unconditional and to all of the Allied countries. The Nazis couldn't just surrender to one of them and keep making war with the others. It, it was all or nothing. Well... Dulles, he knew that, but, you know, he uh, he had other ideas. And 
Between February and May of 1945, he conducted a series of meetings meetings with a Waffen-SS general named Karl Wolf. And what he and Herr Wolf were discussing was uh, a surrender of Nazi Germany to the United States alone. Because Dulles knew full well that it's a historical fact that the Nazis lost basically to Soviet Russia. Soviet Russia beat Nazi Germany. I mean, that's why that war went the way it did. Maybe eventually with the use of the nuclear bomb, uh, we would have beat them anyway, but it, it was the failed invasion of Soviet Russia and the Soviets fighting back that beat Nazism. And incidentally, this is just a side note here, but um, it makes me fucking sick to hear the Manichaean moral language we apply to World War II, I'm trying to talk about that as the good war, you know, the the enormous industry of movies and books and TV shows and blah, 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 based on World War II because that's, that's the last war that Americans feel good about. You know, before that was World War I, and we don't really know or care what that was about. And after it was Korea and... That seems uh, kind of dicey. And then after that is Vietnam and shit. We, we don't want to remember that at all. But World War II, hey, we were on the side of good, fighting for justice and truth. Yeah. Yes and no. Not so much. There was, a, there was American corporate and American political collaboration with Nazi Germany all through that fucking war. Uh... If you've ever wondered, for example, how a nation like Germany, which is not notable as a producer of oil, might, uh, might come up with all the oil and oil byproducts necessary to fuel one of the largest armies the world had ever seen, well, you might ask uh, Texaco and Standard Oil and Shell, and they will be sure not to tell you a goddamn thing about it. Uh, anyway... We have Alan W. Dulles. We have Waffen SS General Karl Wolf in Bern, Switzerland, for three months in 1945, discussing this surrender in which Nazi Germany would surrender specifically to the United States. Because, as I say, uh, Dulles knew that the Soviets had beat the Germans, and he was not looking forward, as many of his. Uh, contemporaries were not looking forward to the prospect of hashing out who exactly was going to get what after the war was over, who was responsible for what and who deserved what. Because Germany, uh, in the 12 years of its rearmament, had proved that it could be an industrial superpower. So, you know, serious interest there in control of Germany and wish to avoid the touchy subject of uh, partitioning a country. And, of course, uh, Dulles and Wolf didn't work anything out. What they did manage to do, however, was accidentally alert the Russians, who told Stalin. And Stalin, of course, uh, you know, being Stalin, went to the next conference. I can't remember which one it was, Potsdam or Yalta. And said, in effect, I knew I couldn't trust you sons of bitches, and... Arguably, that is the first moment of the Cold War. Alan Dulles' attempt to secure an illegal uh, partial surrender of Nazi Germany. So if that's the moment the Cold War is founded, or rather the first shot of the Cold War, we might as well call that the moment the CIA comes into being. Uh, now, the CIA for its first few years was... Uh, a little bit confused, wasn't quite sure what its mandate was, didn't have anywhere near the dynamism it would achieve under Dulles. Uh, first director was a guy named Vice Admiral, an amazing name, Vice Admiral Roscoe H. Hillenkutter. Uh, kind of unfocused, but it did participate in um, one of the grander evil schemes of the later 20th century, though it, it was not a CIA scheme at first. It actually came from uh, NATO. The CIA then joined in later and was responsible for uh, extensive chunks of it. This, some of you may have heard of before, is a little thing called Operation Gladio. Operazione Gladio. 
And the point of Operation Gladio was to establish stay-behind armies, uh, secret ones, first of all in Italy, and then uh, really all over Europe. Let's see, I've got a list here. Uh, there were eventually Gladio stay-behind armies in Belgium, Denmark, France, Germany, Greece, Italy, the Netherlands, Norway, Portugal, and Turkey, and there were affiliates in Austria, Finland, Spain, Sweden, and Switzerland. And all of these stay-behind armies were, uh, let's say, moderate hard right-wing to fanatically ferociously hard right-wing. Because the point of establishing them was that in Italy, as in a number of other countries, well, who beat the fascists? And in the other country's case, who beat the Nazis? Well, it was leftists. It was socialists and communists and anarchists. And um, people in those countries might start getting the uh, dangerous idea that, hey, if socialism or communism or even anarchism could beat the Nazis and the fascists, maybe they were worth trying. So we went through, we meaning first NATO and then the CIA, the remainders of every fascist and fucking phalangist splinter group in Europe, basically, and formed armies that were dedicated to preventing the spread of leftism in those countries and for uh, various kinds of, you know, sort of moderate right-wing terrorism. Uh, they also, I, I don't know if this has ever been proven, but there is at least a fair amount of circumstantial evidence to suggest that they uh, often funded their operations by selling drugs. And that is a thing we will come back to over and over with the CIA. Uh, there is also the suspicion that some of the more violent leftist acts, especially in Italy of uh, you know the 70s, what they call the years of lead, may have been provoked by uh, either members of those stay-behind armies or CIA people working with them. Uh, this, you know, out of context might just sound sort of paranoid or hysterical, but there is a long, 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 long history of the CIA in particular managing to embed itself in uh, groups it considers, you know, subversive or countercultural, and then provoking those groups into doing something outrageous so that it has a chance to crack down on them. Um, I don't know that this is what happened in the Charles Manson case, but I have a suspicion that that's what happened. Uh, people tend to forget the whole thing where uh, the, uh, the actual Manson murderers at first tried to make the murders look like they were committed by a black nationalist group. And we have, we have it directly from an LAPD officer at the time that the LAPD was told to stay away from Manson and the Spawn Ranch, told not to bother them, told not to go out there for noise complaints or whatever. And we also know that Manson was somehow, some way, um, having his lifestyle financed, you know, through all the uh, non-working years of the cold. So it would not surprise me at all to learn that there was some CIA involvement, that what they were trying to do was find someone dumb and suggestible enough to commit a crime that could be blamed on the Black Panthers so they would have an excuse to go out and murder Black Panthers. And eventually they devised the war on drugs instead for that basic purpose, and that worked a lot better and, you know, ended up uh, creating the private prison industry, which has also been a massive boon for them. Now, that's a, a theoretical instance. That's, that's, <laughs> that's just my old paranoia talking. Um, let me tell you about a definite one, one that I have alluded to before. The case of the Symbionese Liberation Army and Patty Hearst. Now, everything I'm about to say has been public since 1975. Just nobody cares or wants to read about it. Uh, the original press clippings you can still find on the website for uh, uh, John Sinclair. Some of you may remember him kind of a sort of political hippie activist founded the White Panther Party, which is a 
pretty prototypical example of <laughs> white people trying to be down in ways that they maybe shouldn't. And later it was way into uh, drug decriminalization, which, though a worthy cause to be sure, is um, a depressing index to the prospects of the left from the 60s going into the 70s. We'd go from you know wanting to tear down the government to wanting to make pot legal. And even if you've never heard of John Sinclair, you have probably heard his voice if you know the MC5 record, Kick Out the Jams. He's the one doing like the fake preacher routine at the beginning. The, I want to see you see your hands out there. I want to see you see your hands. That's John Sinclair. And his website, for whatever reason, I think because he was from uh, the Detroit area and the paper that originally published this was also from Michigan, his website maintains the original publication of these 1975 reports on Patty Hearst and the SLA. So here's how it actually went. It's a fellow CIA agent named Colston Westbrook. Uh, and Colston, uh, he's most notable up until this point for having helped the CIA build and operate uh, detention and torture centers all over Vietnam. Uh, Colston comes home from Vietnam, is looking, casting around for something to do. And this CIA plan comes up to, as they have many times before and will many times later, provoke some kind of, you know, allegedly leftist or insurgent group into doing something wild so that they have a chance for a massive crackdown. Well, Colston figures that what he needs is somebody who is politically very suggestible, who will be in the position to uh, want to be, you know, countercultural, and who's also like maybe kind of not that bright and won't see that he or she is being manipulated. So Colston starts a prison program called the Black Cultural Exchange, in which he goes to, uh, uh, God, I can't at the moment remember if it was just one prison or several but at least one prison, and tries to talk Maoism in particular, but, you know, leftist revolutionary rhetoric to black prisoners in general. And the guy who buys it most fervently is Donald DeFries, who will later become known as the quote-unquote head of the SLA. And the official story here is that DeFries gets out of prison, forms the SLA, they kidnap Patty Hearst, and then, you know, the story proceeds, as everyone knows. They supposedly brainwash her. She helps them rob um, at least one bank, maybe two. Uh, the LAPD eventually sets one of their safe houses on fire. DeFries gets killed. Some of the members go off and try to form a splinter group, and they all end up getting arrested one way or another. Um, what actually happened was this. The... Meetings of the Black Cultural Exchange became kind of a chic thing for, uh, you know, white, count aspiring members of the white counterculture to go to. And uh, Patty Hearst was one of those aspiring members of the counterculture. She used the uh, ID of a friend to get into the prison so that there would not be any record of Patty Hearst having visited... Uh, Don DeFreeze at the Black Cultural Exchange in whatever prison it was. And uh, there's a suggestion that, that she and DeFreeze may have been having an affair, too. I have no idea. But Patty Hearst knew DeFreeze and the, you know, was familiar with the basic concept of the Symbionese Liberation Army uh, way before she was kidnapped. Symbionese was literally taken by Colston Westbrook from some fucking uh, political fantasy thriller about an insurgent leftist group. Hey, wouldn't you know it? And initially, the plan of the nascent Symbionese Liberation Army is to kidnap Patty Hearst's two sisters and hold them for ransom. And then Patty will come out and announce that, you know, she's been converted to the cause of the revolution and that's why the sisters had to be kidnapped, blah, blah, blah. Uh, Patty got cold feet about that one. But... The other members of the SLA, presumably including Colston Westbrook, figured, well, hey, as long as Patty won't uh, kidnap her sisters, why don't we just kidnap Patty? That's what actually happened. 
And the, it turned into a massive clusterfuck. You know, the CIA had accidentally helped kidnap Patty Hearst. And uh, it is provable from the footage of the raid on their safe house that they didn't burn the thing down until they were sure that Patty Hearst wasn't in it. This is one of a million CIA misadventures of, of comparable timbre uh, that I include both as an example of the, you know, fake agent provocateurisme that they practice all the time and as an example of um, how often they fuck up because they do fuck up pretty frequently. But to return here to the early history of the CIA, uh, Operation Gladio is the big move of its first six years. And then Dwight Eisenhower takes, uh, takes over the White House and he installs Alan Welsh Dulles. Uh, and Dulles has a vision for the CIA beyond being just another government agency. Dulles wants the CIA to be what it has become, a secret parallel government. And to this end, he does two things. The first is that he begins placing CIA loyalists in all kinds of other American government agencies. We've already mentioned uh, USAID and the IRC, but he puts CIA people in the Department of State, uh, the Department of Education, the Department of Defense, the Department of the Treasury. Uh, he presumably put them in the FBI, in the NSA. He definitely, and this was a major coup of his, put them in police departments all over the country. Uh, among CIA people, it has been well known for a long time that one of the ways the CIA will test out a strategy or technique is by embedding CIA people inside the Los Angeles police and trying it on basically the ghettos in LA because no one cares about what happens to the ghettos in LA. We've learned that over and over again. And uh, Dulles doesn't stop at government agencies. He also embeds these people, as I mentioned, in private industry, particularly things like defense contracting and electronics and uh, early computers and computer networks and information systems and oil. Oil is uh, ever present. The other thing is that he starts having the CIA invade countries and topple governments. And the first, I believe, in his, uh, his list was uh, Iran. He, he decided that the democratically elected socialist government of Mohammed Mossadegh, you know, which was promising to basically turn Iran into a real country instead of you know, a, an outpost of the Anglo-Persian oil company by nationalizing oil profits, Obviously, we can't have anyone nationalizing oil profits. And in fact, um, the particular question of Iran um, went back to 1946. The inconvenient fact that the Russians and, uh, I believe, British uh, jointly invaded Iran to allegedly keep it safe from fascism, and that after the war, Soviet Russia tried to keep Iran's oil fields uh, this is very rarely talked about, but Harry Truman told Soviet Russia that he would drop a fucking nuclear bomb on them. The oil fields, I mean, if Russia tried to stay there. Truman was very, very horny to use nukes. You know, having done one, I mean, why stop there? <laughs> I'm, I, I believe, for one, that that logic still obtains today. If we ever drop one again, we're not dropping one. We're dropping fucking eight. So... Uh, the CIA, commanded by Dulles, and the British MI6 jointly run an operation to topple the government of Mohammad Mossadegh in Iran in 1953 uh, and to hand power over to the Shah, the first Shah in that particular line of Shahs. God, I can't remember which Shah. There were a number of them. I want to say Reza Shah Pahlavi, but I'm not sure. Uh, anyway, an authoritarian, brutal regime, which eventually, you know, got what was coming to it in the form of the Islamic Revolution, which has been driving both the CIA and the Marines completely fucking insane ever since, but that's another story. And 
It's important to note the corporate threat here. As I mentioned, the Anglo-Persian oil company was not into having its assets nationalized. And the Anglo-Persian oil company would later become the thing we now know as BP or British Petroleum. So the fact that they had a tight enough relationship then for the CIA to get itself involved in a coup uh, suggests that there is serious CIA infiltration at BP too. And uh, speaking of corporations, how about a fucking fruit company? How about the United Fruit Company? Uh, known best for Chiquita brands. Yes, they're the people who make Chiquita banana. Well, both uh, Alan Welsh Dulles and his brother John Foster Dulles had done legal work for United Fruit Company at various points in their lives. And in 1954, United Fruit Company came to them and said, brothers, we got a problem. There's this democratically elected socialist government. They probably didn't say democratically elected. Uh, in Guatemala, uh, they've, they've elected this guy, Jacobo Arbenz. And Arbenz is promising you know, land reform and, and socialization of profits and the end of you know, foreign-owned private industry there. So, on behalf of his old employers at uh, the United Fruit Company, Dulles organized a coup that took out uh, yet another democratically elected socialist, Arbenz, and replaced him with yet another brutal authoritarian, Carlos Castillo Armas. Uh, there's a theme here. <laughs> this, this is how we do things. Uh, I'm jumping ahead of myself a little bit, but... After uh, Kennedy's assassination, a considerable time after it, uh, the CIA ran a massive, years and years long program in Central and South America called Operation Condor. And when I talk about the Third World War having happened already, this is Operation Condor is maybe the clear, clearest example of it. Uh, we went through Latin America country by country and with a remarkably high success rate, uh, the CIA deposed democratically elected and almost always leftist politicians with authoritarian, military, fascist dictatorships. Uh, so Salvador Allende in Chile uh, gets killed and replaced with Augusto Pinochet. Uh, Humberto Gialinsar Castelo Branco. Uh, replaces the democratically elected socialist Juan Goulart in Brazil. We prop up Hugo Banzer in Bolivia. We prop up Aparicio Mendes in Uruguay. We prop up Alfredo Stroessner in Paraguay. Uh, we, oh God, the dirty war in Argentina. No one knows how many dead. No one knows how many disappeared and eventually uh, ends up with the basically fascist Generalissimo Videla uh, running the government. And uh, after Operation Condor in Guatemala, uh, we prop up Jose Napoleon Duarte, uh, <laughs> who, uh, among other things, uh, got weapons from fucking Israel after Congress finally decided to cut off funding to his government. Uh, in the course of Operation Condor, we killed, and these are official government numbers, so you know they're too low. We killed, or will admit to having killed, between sixty and 80,000 people and having, having politically imprisoned 400,000 people. And uh, if, you, if you want an idea of, not just of the political specifics here, but of the, you know, the lived specifics, if, if you want to know some lives to look into uh, as examples of the other side of all this, uh, examples of living in these places while we in the America and uh, the America, we in the United States in the 1970s were, well, you know, we were very busy with um, introspection and cocaine and Fleetwood Mac. So we didn't have time to worry about this shit. Uh, look up a few people, look up, a, a few people I would not hesitate to call heroes. Um, Orlando Letelier, Victor Jara, and especially the journalist Rodolfo Walsh. Learn about Rodolfo Walsh. 
if if nobody else. Just as an example of the kind of fucking evil in which every single one of us has been complicit since 53 at the earliest and really 45 and really before 45 in terms of American collaboration with the Nazis. Uh, now, the specific ties between CIA and Kennedy that end with him killing them, I think I want to save for the next episode. I think they fit better under the rubric of looking at who John Kennedy was and why they wanted him dead. But I would here uh, emphasize that after Kennedy, after Condor, uh, none of this has changed. There has been no contre-coup. The CIA, you know, its fortunes have fared better and worse under different presidents. But we had a former fucking director of the CIA for president, George H.W. Bush, a man who uh, allegedly, you know, how will we ever prove this, but allegedly, according to several sources, was at the first meeting of what is variously called Operation 40 or Group 40. It was a, a group of CIA-connected people that Eisenhower convened in 1959 to basically be a task force on political assassinations. So George H.W. Bush has been not only CIA, but fucking knee-deep in blood since 1959. Um, let's not forget... Iran Contra, Iran Contra, the, you know, something that, that sort of like the Kennedy assassination has become a, such a relic of an age that we don't consider it as any kind of object lesson about our political world, about its possibilities and impossibilities, about the contours that, you know, the real powers that be have decided it must follow. I'm sure most of you know the story generally of Iran Contra, but briefly speaking, uh, a left-wing group called the Sandinistas takes over Nicaragua from the right-wing dictator Anastasio Somoza. We, of course, cannot abide this. We, we, I mean, good God, communists that close to the United States. Uh, same bullshit we said about Castro. So we decide to... Uh, to fund and arm a counter-revolution there. Except eventually uh, an amendment passes, uh, it's called the Bolin Amendment, if I'm not mistaken, that prohibits further funding to the Nicaraguan Contras, the Contra Revolucionarios. Um, because frankly, most people in uh, the legislature at that point just can't fucking see why we're involved in this. So, we have to figure out, and this is mid and late 70s, uh, how to fund and arm this guerrilla group without any official American money. And someone or other falls on the brilliant idea of drug trafficking because one of the most prominent Nicaraguan uh, right-wing exiles is a guy named Norwin Meneses who was the crime boss, the you know mafioso leader in Managua before the revolution, and who not coincidentally was also the brother of the head of Nicaragua's secret police, the Guardia Civil. Uh, so Meneses has all kinds of connections to uh, drug manufacturers, drug distributors, drug traffickers, and he and his people, in collaboration with the CIA, decide to run cocaine into the United States to finance the secret war. But there's a problem here, you see, because at the time, late 70s, cocaine is a rich people's drug. And these rich people mostly do it in short binges. It's too expensive for all but the incredibly rich to do all the time. There aren't many people who, you know, are just consistently taking bumps of coke throughout the day. So they run into a, a supply and demand problem. They have more coke than they can sell. And the abundance of it is making it cheaper, which, of course, is bringing in less money. So they need to figure out a way to turn cocaine into a mass market drug. And um, there are various accounts of how this happened. And you can look them up and believe which one you want. But somebody figured out, hey, if you do this set of uh, 
of chemical alterations to the basic structure of cocaine. You cook it up with some baking powder and then you, you boil it and then you kind of scrape off the scum and then you let the scum dry into little rocks. You smoke those rocks and you get high as all living hell, but only for like 10, 15 minutes. And uh, when the high wears off, as William S. Burroughs once said, you will walk across town to get another one. Uh, and the great thing about this is they only need a tiny amount of cocaine in them. We can cut, you know, say a thousand dollar brick of Coke and make 10 or a hundred thousand hits of this new rock cocaine out of it, you know, increase our profit margin a thousand, 10,000, a hundred thousand times. And the best thing about it is because we only need to put a tiny amount of Coke in each rock, we can sell them for cheap. We can bring in people who could never afford cocaine before. So we've got it. We've got our working man's cocaine. We've got our mass market cocaine. This thing we're going to call crack. Now, you can insist, if you really, really want to, that the sudden appearance of crack in ghettos and particularly black ghettos all over the United States was, um, you know, just just market forces, just where they felt they could sell this stuff. You can believe that if you want to. Um, to me, I look at the CIA bringing massive amounts of coke into the United States, uh, virtually inventing crack, you know, for all mass market purposes, and then selling it specifically in poor neighborhoods and especially poor black neighborhoods. I look at that and um, the word that comes to mind is not coincidence or happenstance. It's fucking eugenics. And the crack epidemic, I mean... Its effects have been astonishing to a degree that I don't think many of us appreciate because, you know, we've grown up in a post-crack world, so its contours are naturalized to us. But crack made uh, drug dealing so much more violent because it was so much more lucrative, which meant uh, bigger and bigger guns employed in, you know, turf wars a turf war that once might have come down to you know, fists and knives they're fucking ak-47s and rocket launchers now this in turn allowed the massive militarization of police forces and their occupation of primarily poor primarily black neighborhoods where they could treat everyone like a fucking prisoner as they still absolutely do i mean you say one name, Mike Brown, Eric Garner, Tamir Rice, Trayvon Martin, uh, and you get this cold liquid weight in your chest because you know you could just keep naming names until you passed out and nothing would fucking change. So the cops were able to move in as an occupying army and, and uh, since we're talking about coincidences and happenstance, the legal penalties for crack – uh, massively more severe than the legal penalties for powder cocaine, which is what rich white people w were still doing. You know, some places the sentencing was 20 to 1. So crack became the cornerstone of the for-profit prison industry. Uh, and crack, the occupation and militarization of the ghettos and the private prison industry were in turn the driving forces behind the Bill Clinton crime bill that established mandatory minimums and has swollen the American prison population to uh, a size unprecedented, not just in this country, but in um, a democracy, <laughs> or at least a nominal democracy in world history. Uh, th the Iran part of it is usually sort of... Uh, passed over and i mean understandably so given the contra part of it but let's not forget too that it basically consisted of stealing the 1980 presidential election that uh there were hostages hostages being held in iran that the iranians were demanding weapons that we officially were saying no 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 we'll never give you weapons this would be uh jimmy carter as president uh and that 
the uh, the Iranian hostage crisis, dogged Carter all the way through the latter half of his presidency, and was one of the reasons that Reagan got elected. And then I believe it was on the day Reagan was inaugurated, the Iranian hostages were magically released. And it was, of course, because, yeah, we sold them fucking weapons. The CIA sold them weapons. And it used the profits from the weapon sales like it used the profits from the crack sales to continue funding the illegal war in Nicaragua. So, you know, a, a downplayed aspect of that whole affair, but uh, the theft of an election. You know, I mean, God, if Ronald Reagan hadn't been elected fucking president and, you know, one could go on and on and on in terms of CIA history. But I, I, I feel at this point uh, you've got a, a decent idea of what the CIA actually is, the kind of thing it's done. So I'll leave you with uh, two recent incidents uh, on the next episode. We're going to get to Kennedy and his specific involvement with the CIA and also to the question of Lee Harvey Oswald. Who the fuck was Lee Harvey Oswald? Uh, the answer is, of course, not who you're told he was. But two more things about the CIA. Number one, uh, the recent and by most people, it would seem, forgotten war in Libya. Well, as I have remarked in other venues at other times, the conspiracy right, the world of Alex Jones, uh, those people have this incredible instinct for finding something that really does need to be looked into and then fixating on the stupidest fucking parts of it. So Alex Jones, of course, spent his time obsessed with Benghazi, you know, the fact that President Obama, he sent our troops in there to die. You know, he, he didn't care what happened to Ambassador Stevens, that, that fucking murderer. Um... The, the scandal of Benghazi is not some fucking, you know, stand down order or whatever it was supposed to be. The scandal of Benghazi is this, that the CIA and Hillary Clinton's State Department were running what was on the surface a gun collection program, getting arms from, you know, dispersed Libyan rebel groups after the war, the invasion, I should say. Uh, what they were actually doing was trafficking those weapons to al-Qaeda in Syria to fight Bashar al-Assad. That's the scandal there. Uh, Seymour Hirsch wrote all about this. And of course, Seymour Hirsch, for telling the fucking truth, has been exiled to the pages of the London Review of Books when he wants to write about you know, the Syrian civil war. Uh, there's one recent instance. And the last one I'm going to mention... One I'm not completely sure of, but I have a real strong leaning. Uh, Edward Snowden, celebrated as a hero on much of the left, maybe center left would be more accurate, you know, disclosure of all the NSA surveillance programs, uh, the guy whose story helped get the intercept off the ground. And look, I have a lot of admiration and appreciation for Glenn Greenwald's work and for Jeremy Scales' work. Uh, Pierre Omidyar, somewhat less so. Uh, but Snowden, it is not often mentioned, was CIA. And, and this is not like a conspiracy theory. I mean, it's on the record that he was a CIA agent. Uh, allegedly quit the CIA over a plot to get some influential banker drunk and then blackmail him for a drunk driving charge which given the things he would have been doing in the CIA already, I don't believe for a fucking instant. And then, you know, supposedly becomes an independent uh, contractor via uh, Booz Allen Hamilton, I believe is where he was when he uh, made the NSA disclosures. Well, the thing about Snowden that makes me suspicious apart from his ever having been in the CIA, because as I say, you know, you're in an organization, you're privy to that sort of information. I don't believe that they ever let you leave. I, I don't believe there is any kind of get out of jail card for having been exposed to that kind of shit. But the other thing is Tor, the supposedly encrypted browser Tor. Certainly in my awareness, it was Edward Snowden who popularized Tor 
who made that the thing you use if you don't want to be tracked on the internet. You know, he evangelized for it up and down. Well, Tor is and always has been a CIA project. Tor was originally basically a, a, a web server for spies. But the problem with a web server for spies is that if everyone on it is a spy, anyone who can hack into it can then identify, you know, hundreds of thousands of spies. So they needed pedestrian traffic on tour, on tour, pardon me. Um, and suddenly Snowden is out here evangelizing for it. And, you know, I, I have never uh, actually used tour. I've watched it in use. But my understanding of it is that, you know, there is something analogous, at least, to a login and a log out point. You know, you have to get into it and get out of it. You don't just open and close it. Well, uh, as Yasha Levine discussed on that Radio Warner episode I recommended, let's see, how long would it be now? Three and a half years ago. Um, Tor has been proven to send data directly to the CIA every time you use it. That clock out hub, that log out area, whatever you'd call it, that is wide fucking open to the CIA. They have uh, the complete internet history of anyone who's ever used Tor. And the fact that Snowden both worked at the CIA during the years Tor was being developed and then as a supposed whistleblower is out here telling people to use Tor because it's the only really safe way to use the internet – makes me think, all right, this is a fucking rat. And all his, you know, supposedly brave disclosures about NSA spying programs, well, they may have been brave in their way. I mean, certainly his life hasn't been convenient since then. But they were more about an intramural NSA-CIA power struggle than they were about any concerns uh, about the erosion of civil liberties or, you know, warrantless wiretapping or dragnet surveillance or unjustified spying. Because clearly the man who both worked for the CIA and advocating – the man who both worked for the CIA and advocates the use of Tor, I should say, doesn't give a fuck about, you know, people's data being stolen. He's actively encouraging them to go out there and essentially hand it to the CIA. So this simply to say that the uh, – the world established, the political economy of means established uh, after the Kennedy assassination, or let's refer to it in less banal terms, after the CIA murdered John Kennedy, uh, this has not ended. This is not going to end. It has perhaps uh, waxed and waned a little bit under different administrations, but it is still absolutely in force, and it is still the guiding power of our foreign policy, which, as I've already said, you know, the hierarchies of governmental spending uh, determines so much domestic policy. And again, I would say to the left, no popular mandate, no overwhelming majority of public support, no, you know, beloved federal program uh, has the power in itself to get anything done when the actual direction of the state is so hugely determined by a clandestine parallel government, when the actual policies enacted here are just the, the dregs of policies that someone else is deciding to enact elsewhere. Uh, this was one of the reasons, actually the central reason, that I was first excited about Bernie Sanders, because uh, Sanders' politics, you know, uh, in any sane political spectrum, Bernie Sanders is a centrist. I mean, he's about halfway between socialism and capitalism. If that's not what centrism is, you know, fuck out of here. It's just we're such a right-wing country that he seems far left. You know, there are, I think, a lot of things left to be desired in Bernie Sanders' politics. But I knew that Bernie Sanders uh, in the 1970s made it a political goal to abolish the CIA. That was part of what made me take him seriously, uh, made me think he, he wasn't just another of the, 
you know, the the class of Dennis Kucinich, you know, kinder, gent, gentler, better liberals than the kind we've had, but but ultimately nothing beyond that. Uh, I worry about a left, especially a left that, you know, slowly, 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 but truly is is gaining a real following, you know, in in the massive and hideous wake of the Clinton's astonishing failure. And boy, if you need something fucked up, call a Clinton, because a Clinton can fuck up anything. I worry that that left and, you know, uh, the left, particularly in its newfound position of visibility, is not ready to contend at all with the question of uh, whether or not politics is really a matter of, you know, getting the votes and convincing the people with whether or not there are uh, much more rigid and older and I should say not even more secret, just more cryptic uh, agencies in both the, you know, literal and the philosophical sense, which have determined a whole lot of what we're going to do years before we do it and which essentially leave you with table scraps to carry out whatever you thought was your domestic agenda. And uh, as we will discuss at some length next time, uh, you try to trespass on that and your wife will be trying to fit a chunk of bone back onto your head. <laughs> I, uh, I think that's enough for now. So we will see you hopefully, presumably next week on Death is Just Around the Corner.